Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alexander Becker. I'm a sophomore at the University of Hawaii studying economics. I'll be your session chair for block one. I want to provide a couple of reminders before I introduce our first speaker. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to present. The discussant will have five minutes following each presenter and we'll spend five minutes for Q&A um, following the discussant's remarks. If you are here with us in Cleveland and would like to ask the presenter a question, you'll be given time to ask your question following the discussant's comments. Virtual attendees can place questions in the Q&A uh, feature of the bottom of your screen in Zoom. You can upload and ask your question and honestly, if you have a question for a specific speaker, please include their name at the beginning of your question. Now to kick things off, I would like to introduce Isabel Hanze, a junior from St. Catherine University, speaking to us in person on the impact of gender-based labor laws and innovation on the gender wage gap. Isabel, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Um... So my name is Isabel Hanse. I'm a junior at St. Catherine University majoring in economics, and I studied the impact of gender-based labor laws and innovation on the gender wage gap. So to start off with, the United States was the first country to pass an equal pay law in 1963. So that was 60 years ago, and today we still have a gender wage gap that is quite significant. So women in the US make 77 cents for every $1 that a white man earns, and for women of color, this number is lower. And so I wanted to study how effective are these gender-based labor laws in reducing the gender wage gap. So the previous literature shows that it is not significant. So in Ontario, um, they passed an equal pay law back in 2015, I believe. And so Thornton and um, McDonald studied the impact this had on the gender wage gap, and they found that there was no significant impact. In addition, Polacek determined that these labor laws had no significant impact on the gender wage gap, and he mentioned um, tools such as daycare utilization and improving women's lifetime work would be more efficient in reducing the wage gap. And so to study this, I also include um, a measure of innovation, as innovation has been shown to increase income inequality in the United States. Um, and so I find that the four labor laws have no significant impact on the gender wage gap when including them in their own regression, but when adding innovation as a third interaction, I find that three of the four labor laws are significant. So my key variables include the gender wage gap, which is uh, recorded as a percentage, and this is from the OECD as well as Our World in Data. And this is collected from 99 countries, ranging from 1970 to 2020. And I include four labor laws. One is an equal remuneration, which is an equal pay law, uh, prohibiting employment discrimination based on sex, legislation mentoring, mentioning sexual harassment in the workplace, and criminal penalties for sexual harassment in the workplace. I also include nine gender norms relating to employment and entrepreneurship. So this is if women can join or can enter the workforce the same as a man, or if they can work in a hazardous job the same as men. And for my innovation measure, I include the number of patent applications by country residents in thousands, which is collected from the World International Intellectual Property Organization, ranging in 99 countries from 1970 to 2020. And so the main issue with my data is that it is unbalanced. So a lot of the countries um, have missing data in one of the years or in a couple of the years, or there's a huge gap, which is um, partially controlled for by the two-way fixed effects that I include in my regression. So my empirical framework, I conduct multiple quasi-experimental difference and difference on the four labor laws and a combination of them all. So the first regression shows that I, my Y is the gender wage gap, and then the treatment times post is the DID estimation. Patents is the number of patents, and the gender norms, which is a vector of all nine gender norms, as well as the country and year fixed effects. My second regression includes the same variables as the first, but includes a triple interaction with the DID estimation with the patents to determine if there is any significant impact when interacting innovation and these gender-based labor laws. And so I hypothesize that on their own, these four labor laws will have no significant impact mirroring the literature. And so one of the main issues with my empirical framework 
is that many of these countries implemented these laws at different times, which causes the staggered treatment effects. Um, in addition, the multiple treatment effects of including all four gender-based labor laws in one regression has been shown to possibly show bias, but I again control for this using the two-way fixed effects, and I will mention um, other methods in the future. Okay, so for my fr the first um, regression that I run is just on all four uh, labor laws without including the patent variable uh, interaction. It is controlled for as well as the nine labor laws or the nine gender norm, excuse me. And so we see that there are no significant impacts for each of the labor laws as individual and as well as in the complete um, regression. So my second regressions include uh, the interaction terms. So we see that post three times patent is significant, illustrating that countries that have these labor laws and an increase in patents will see a decrease in the gender wage gap by about 0.3%. And this labor law was um, a legislation mentioning sexual harassment in the workplace. But when including criminal penalties for sexual harassment in the workplace, this number decreases slightly, um, illustrating a smaller positive impact, um, but is still negative in that it reduces the gender wage gap. And lastly, post one is the equal pay law. So the interaction itself is not significant, but the interaction cre um, caused the labor law itself to be significant in that it negatively, or it, it reduces the gender wage gap by about 1%. And so then my last regressions includes um, all of the labor laws in one regression analysis. So we see that the post three, which is again the legislation mentioning uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, it becomes positive. However, when controlling for the interaction with patents, it does reduce this positive effect slightly, illustrating that countries with higher patents and these laws may see um, an increase, but it's slightly lower. Um, and in addition, the equal pay law is negative again, but the interaction becomes positive, illustrating that this, that including the number of patents will reduce the positive effect of these labor laws. And again, the issue of multiple um, treatments in one regression could create some bias illustrating, causing these weird results. So it should be taken with a slight grain of salt until I can implement a stronger method for this. So in conclusion, the labor laws have no statistically significant impact on the gender wage gap on their own. However, when including innovation, this um, creates a reduction in the gender wage gap for three of the four labor laws. And so my overall conclusion is that these additional three labor laws studied mirror the impact of equal pay laws and that governments should look into keeping these labor laws, but ensuring that they are strong enough to reduce the loopholes that many organizations are able to jump through. And in addition, other laws such as wage transparency, um, improving daycare utilization, and maternal and paternal uh, leave policies may be more apt to reduce the gender wage gap in the future, as well as finding complete gender wage gap to then implement these new DID methods that have been uh, discussed and proven um, in the recent past, and this would be able to then provide a more robust analysis of these gender-based labor laws. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I open the floor for discussions and Q&A. Thank you. Um, sure, so I'll overtake, uh, take over from here. Uh, my name is Leonard Hawk. I'm uh, studying international economics and finance at Bocconi University in Milan in Italy currently. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Isabel for presenting this uh, great paper on uh, in, in the sec intersection of public economics and uh, and law. And so as a sort of as a discussant, I will first sort of summarize the paper uh, real quick and then uh, add some comments of my own. So, um, Isabel, your research question was whether gender-based uh, equality legislation in different countries was successful in reducing the pay, uh, gender pay gap, and if uh, innovation in in these countries has some sort of influence on whether these uh, whether this type of legislation was uh, successful or not. And um, 
So for your for your data set, you use data from the OECD and World Bank and some other sources. And um, you highlighted that this data was unbalanced, which I found was very good because um, you know you you highlight some of the potential shortcomings that this data could could pose to your research. And so um, to to study whether there is an effect or not, you used a difference in difference model, and which can study the effect of a piece of legislation. Um, depending on two groups, a treatment group and a control group, and if there is any difference between uh, those groups. And you also highlighted some shortcomings of uh, this model, which you uh, said in the in your presentation as well, the staggered treatment effect. And also you, uh, in the paper, you showed that uh, there are some assumptions that might not uh, definitely hold for the data, such as no anticipation reactions or the uh, common trend assumption. But I think that um, you had some really major contributions for, for your research or for research in general in the uh, gender pay gap um, in, in that there is no statistically significant effect of these laws on their own. But when also incorporating innovation that uh, the effect becomes significant and reduces, um, reduces the gender pay gap. And so, of course, this has some important policy implications, as you mentioned. Um, most uh, importantly, that uh, current policy is not adequate completely when, uh, when analyzed qualitatively and quantitatively in order to reduce the uh, gender pay gap to zero, and that uh, some other policies uh, should be taken into consideration um, that could maybe uh, be more instrumental in reducing the uh, gender pay gap. And I think your research is very, really very important because a lot of people agree that the gender pay gap is a problem and that it can only be closed uh, by using effective legislation. And so to, to check whether our current legislation is actually effective, we of course have to analyze that legislation and, and that's what you've done. And I think that you, you motivate your research really well what I uh, think that you could have maybe done in the paper, which you did do in your presentation, was uh, just give a brief overview of what the gender pay gap is and why people think that um, it should be reduced. Uh, and I also think that um, what you did really well in the in your presentation was to highlight why innovation could also play a factor in the gender pay gap and legislation uh, surrounding it which uh, for me came a little bit out of the blue uh, when, when reading your paper. But I think that overall your arguments uh, really flow nicely and, and make sense. And your papers and presentation are both uh, structured very clear, clearly and uh, give a clear message in, in each passage. But sometimes I think that uh, some of your explanations for the results could have been a bit more convincing a bit more detailed to why there might be uh, these types of relationships that you found and when uh, when a certain law is passed. But I think that um, nevertheless, you're there, there's definitely a lot of future re research to do in this, uh, in this field to check whether uh, which types of laws are, are best in reducing the gender pay gap. And I think that your paper and, and presentation here uh, has shown some some good first steps into into that uh, into that field and I think that you should uh, continue to to uh, yeah do some research here thanks I'll open the floor to the Q&A part so I'll maybe ask a question if that's okay um, that's my perspective as the research director here I suppose um, so okay so you find in your first stage that more innovative countries tend to have a smaller wage gap uh, which might suggest that maybe they're a little bit more progressive in terms of thinking about wage equality in the first place. So are you concerned that that makes them more likely than to pass that legislation in the first place, which might then complicate your empirical strategy? Yes, so I did um, consider that and I did a little bit of the research looking at um, these countries that have these higher number of um, innovation uh, measures. Um, and I did find, yes, that there are these countries that are more likely to implement these um, laws, have these innovation. However, I still included it in the model because women are often left out of the long process of innovation. And so I wanted to keep that to understand how exactly 
innovation is helping the gender wage gap, if it's helping men more than women, or if it's helping them equally, and then it's slowly reducing, or if it's helping women more than men and reducing that wage gap, which is why I kept it in the regression. Then my follow-up question, since nobody else has their hand up, would be, um, do you know if the patents were filed by men or women, and if passing one of these laws makes women more likely to file patents, which would help to close the gender wage gap? Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the gender of the individuals who filed the patents. I looked long and hard for that, um, so I did just have to settle on applicants in the country residence. Hi, so I'm a first year at Case Western Reserve University, and you know, I was just thinking uh, as you were presenting, um, what came to mind were uh, uh, high X points on substantive rules. So, if if we wanted to say reduce the uh, gender wage gap through legislation or through adjudication, uh, what it, what would you consider a uh, fair uh, in that uh, producing of legislation? Uh, say if women tend to have different work habits than men, and how will boosting, uh, like, well, how would reducing the wage gap uh, come off to say to men um, if they were to see that they, the laws were benefiting uh, women more than them? That's a good question. So when reading the literature on the wage transparency laws, it did, um, by closing the gender wage gap, it did reduce men's wages um, in that, but it wasn't a significant reduction in their wages. So although it did decrease, um, it is something to note with um, gender equality that in order for women to match with men, one has to change. So either women have to make more money, men have to make less money. And so I think understanding exactly where the gender wage gap is coming from. So whether it's women leaving work to have children and they're the stereotypical um, in society to stay home with the child, if understanding that that is what's changing, then knowing and then changing those policies. So different policies that would help both men and women, but again, keeping women in the labor force just as long as men. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter of session one, Sedona Jolly, a junior from Case Western Reserve University who will be discussing, I am the law and I speak for the trees, the impact of rights of nature legislation on local air quality. Sedona, all you. Hello everyone, my name is Sedona Jolly. I am a third year at Case Western Reserve University and today I'm going to be talking with you all about rights of nature and their potential impacts on air quality. So this is a project that my capstone partner Sierra Williams and I have been working on only for the past semester and I plan on continuing this project into the fall so I really 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 am looking forward to hearing your questions and getting your feedback. Um, feel free to interrupt me while I'm giving the presentation because the whole purpose of this is I want to know what are some potential directions that we could take this, uh, what are some potential drawbacks that can be addressed over the summer and into the fall. So without further ado, let's talk about what rights of nature are. <laughs> so this is a fairly new concept, at least in the Western world, but it's this idea that nature, land, ecosystems, um, both the living and non-living parts of the ecosystem um, have inherent rights. Now this is, um, again, a rather, a rather new idea, but many places starting in the early 2000s around the world have brought these laws into being um, at the local level, at the national level. As you can see, Ecuador was the first country to actually implement rights of nature in their constitution, whereas Tamaqua Burial, which we'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide, was the first place in the world, and it was a local city in the United States to give nature rights in the law. So what this means is similar to how corporations are able to be represented in court as people, in some places uh, similar rights have been extended to forests, rivers, trees, ecosystems, and other natural entities. 
So to make this a little bit more concrete, since um, I'm not sure how many of you all are familiar with uh, rights of nature, this is an example of Tamaqua Borough. This was a city um, about 100 miles um, east of Philadelphia, and it was a former mining town, and after the mining industry declined, you could, there were these huge pits, as you can see in red, that were left by um, what were former coal mines. So the people that owned these pits um, ended up selling them out so that people can put fly ash and sewage into them. And this is technically legal because sewage sludge can be used um, typically in small quantities as fertilizer for, for, for farmers. But in these large quantities, people in Tobacco Borough were starting to notice various health effects. And there wasn't much that they could do given the established legal structure to um, protect themselves from this. Many people from this town don't have the resources, one, for health insurance to deal with the negative health effects that they were noticing. and to, to be able to potentially sue the companies behind this on their own to pr improve harm to themselves as an individual. So they enacted rights of nature, which would mean that in this city, um, for particular harm, harm could be shown to have been done to the environment, which makes it um, in this way a little bit easier to prove legally. So there's a couple more examples, but um, if you want to chat more after this, just for time's sake, I'll, I'll skip them a little bit. But I do want to mention a bit about Ohio, um, because Ohio is actually one of the places where a lot of cities and have started to try to pass these bills, um, most notably uh, Toledo, after the huge algae bloom in Lake Erie, wanted to declare rights of nature for Lake Erie. However, that was quickly shut down um, by the state of Ohio. And um, there's a couple other cities, and eventually it got so annoying that Ohio was like, mm -mm, no, no more of these bills, <laughs> no, no more of this. But I don't think that this is necessarily because Ohio hates the environment. Ohio is just a little bit skeptical because um, as, of, as of late, there really isn't much evidence that these bills work to do what they're intended to do, which is to protect the environment and protect the health of the people that rely upon it. And so it makes sense to be just a little bit a little bit skeptical until you have some empirical research behind it. So what there exists right now, there's a lot of stuff in philosophy, there's a lot of stuff in law, and th there's just not much empirical work and very scarce literature in economics on this topic overall. Um, but there are some, some papers that do suggest that laws at the local level could potentially impact environmental outcomes, and they're is some theory that would suggest that giving rights to an entity, like say a river, um, might increase the risk of a lawsuit or assigning appropriate property rights to nature to own themselves <laughs> might um, potentially reduce some of the next negative externalities in the production process of, of many, many firms. So our, our main question, again, to try to hopefully <laughs> to, to, to answer is, is do, these, do these bills work? There's, a, there's there wasn't really an expansive data set until this fall that included all of the places in the world where rights of nature have been passed. So this is a really, really cool opportunity for my partner and I to be able to get in the weeds and take a look at, at these bills. So um, we find in the end that there is about a three percentage point increase in the share of good air quality days in any given year following the passage of one of these bills. This equates to about um, just over a week of good of additional good air quality days, and this is statistically significant at the 10% level. So um, why why air quality? It seems like a little bit of a of a strange measure, but the main the main reason is um, there's there's three reasons for that. One, data. <laughs> it's it was is it's publicly available um, from the EPA for every single county in the United States from 2000 to 2020, um, 2022 actually. Uh, as well as air quality is a really strong indicator for public health. Um, about 200,000 deaths annually in the United States are associated with poor air quality. And lastly, air quality is a good measure of environmental health because the environment, again, is an ecosystem. So air quality is correlated with water quality, which is correlated with the um, with the land quality, and it's a good, it's an overall good measure for that. So here's a little bit more about air quality measures. Again, we could chat more about the specifics of this um, afterwards if you'd like. Um, but so, so what, what does our, what does our data look like? So we ended up um, gathering data from the EPA, from this uh, data set that was published in the fall by Putzer et al. And um, the uh, ACS data to get data on like unemployment and it's, it's other things about um, each of the states. And we're only looking at states where air quality was 
passed. So our unit of observation is going to be a county in a given year. And what we're going to do, um, sorry, I'll talk about that. I'll just, I want to explain on this slide instead, um, is going to be a county in a given year. And so there's about 636 counties in our data set. And um, of those, of those counties, 76 of those passed these bills. And um, about 15% of the time, so 15% of our observations, uh, these, these laws are on or the laws have passed. And so when we, um, in order to find this effect, we end up employing um, a couple of statistics, so a couple of econometric methods, but most notably, we use a Callaway Santa Ana staggered difference in difference model, um, which means that we're going to be looking at this. We're going to we're going to be looking at the uh, the difference in differences in a bunch of from a bunch of difference comparisons in order to find the average effect for um, any given any given um, law passed in any given in any given year. Um, what, what would we expect the difference to be following that? This is um, a, bi a binary, so some places might have passed more than one law, but we're just looking at, okay, is there a law that is on, is not yet, or never passed? We're going to compare this law passed group to this law never passed group. Okay, so some evidence to suggest that we would need to use slightly more advanced econometric methods than a standard regression is this graph. So in the, the lower line are rights of our, our treatment group. Um, as you see, that would be like the circle on the left. So these are places that eventually pass rights of nature bills. And on average, these places already have far lower air quality than places that did not pass these bills. Um, I think this might kind of come as a surprise. This definitely came as a surprise to me because I figured these bills might be more common in places that are really liberal and already really care a lot about the environment, but it seems to be the opposite, which was kind of surprising. And in the years following the passage of the first Rights of Nature bill in 2006, this gap between our treatment and treatment and control group, in quotation marks, seems to be getting smaller. So we want to know if the passage of these rights of nature bills can explain this shrink um, in the gap between places that did not pass the bills and places that did. And so, again, our simple OLS regression and our multivariate regression suggest the opposite, that um, being in a place that has rights of nature is actually reduces your air quality. But this is likely, this is because on average places with, that pass these bills have lower air quality to begin with and don't end up surpassing their, their peers. However, um, we, we, again, we employ this um, difference in difference model where we are going to take a look at, um, for any given year, we're going to say this is the year that the bill is passed and we're going to compare the difference between the, the time, the average of the time prior to the bill passing and the time following the bill passing between the groups that, pa that end up passing the bill and the groups that don't to see if there is a difference in that, um, in that second period for any group for, so for every single year past. And we also look at um, the dynamic effects for the changes over time. So is this an immediate effect? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't expect Sorry, um, as soon as- Sorry, minutes is up. Okay. <laughs> um, is it okay if I continue for like three more minutes just just a little bit. I have some really cool graphs I want to show, and I think they're really important. Is that okay? Um, Yay! Okay. So, um, so, well, so again, this is our average treatment effect that I mentioned before. Um, so this is our event study, study, so the dynamic effects. So like I mentioned, you probably wouldn't expect to see. Uh, you pass a bill, all of a sudden, boom, instantly air quality is better. But it does seem to be um, uh, increasing over time. So there's so. Um, in the pre in the pre treatment period, on average, you have about equal data points above and below zero, whereas in the post treatment period, all of the data points are above zero. And in addition, this is an example of each of the groups. So for every single year that a rights of nature bill was passed, we um, calculated the difference difference effect of what is the 
expected um, change in air quality in the post-treatment period for bills passed in this year, and the majority of the time this is a positive effect, and the average is, again, around a three percentage point increase. So there's a bunch of problems, and I'll chat with you about those problems if you want to chat about the problems later. So one of them is, again, spillover effects, air quality, air is everywhere. So we hope that the difference in difference might control for some of the, the general air quality trends in the state. But again, there, if you're comparing to neighbors, um, what, what one county does, does is going to affect another county. There might be potential limited variable bias with different states passing different bills that we'd have to control for in the future, um, as well as some certain limitations in the data. We would much prefer to have uh, data at the city level, but we could only find data at the county level, as well as um, potential collider bias with certain counties being overrepresented in terms of the number of data points that we have, and these are generally places that are have larger populations, so more rural areas. We wouldn't have as many data points on their uh, air quality. Now, future research. So because this is the first time that this data has even been out there, um, the first time that there's been an empirical analysis looking at the effect of these bills, there is a whole lot that can be done beyond this. So looking at different outcomes, like what about water quality? What about ground quality? What about species, endangered species? What about um, looking at like specific molecules in the, in the air quality that like for ex PM 2.5s? Um, different com treatment comparison groups. What about comparing groups that almost passed the bill and then didn't? Um, what about this cost best benefit analysis? This is a huge part that's missing from, from my presentation, which is, well, okay, great, it has an effect, but is it worth it? You know, is it worth it? Is it worth it to, for the potential risk for the Ohio and farmers? Is it worth it? Maybe industries decide that they don't want to work there and it, it causes people's wages to decrease. So how can we, how can we figure out whether or not these, these bills are, are worth the cost? And um, better controls. <laughs> I would love to see, um, to get some controls on the political orientation of the places as well as altitude, forest fires, um, stuff like that to try to make sure that our, our results are more statistically robust. But in all, this primary, pre preliminary findings are fairly positive. They don't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that they're like, oh yes, this is the be all end all solution to climate change and um, conservation work. But I would say that it, it does suggest that there is potential for these bills, but there is definitely a, a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of understanding what specific kinds of bills and what places and at what times, what applications of them actually work. Um, for whom and at what cost. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Sedona. I open the floor to our discussant. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sedona, for presenting this uh, amazing paper in, in the field of public economics and law. And um, I think that that uh, your presentation was great and that you really noticed uh, how passionate you are about this subject. So um, yeah, this is uh, this this all sounds great. I'll keep it short um, sort of because uh, in, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, keep my, my comments short. So um, your research question was whether uh, passing of, of rights of nature legislature had an effect on or, or has an effect on air quality. And so um, these rights of nature laws are, from what I understand, laws that give uh, natural bodies such as uh, forests and, and rivers uh, specific rights that sort of go above and beyond um, their usual protection in the, in the law, law as they are currently. And they've been very controversial in the past, as, you've, as you highlighted in your um, paper. Some argued that uh, rights of nature laws are necessary uh, to protect, uh, protect nature, and some argued the contrary, that they aren't necessary, that current protection is enough, and that maybe even um, because in other cases in which uh, groups that needed protection uh, weren't able to be protected by, by laws passing, um, that rights of nature laws would be ineffective anyways. And so um, you used a, a difference in differences model to uh, check if there is a statistically, statistically significant um, effect of the passing of rights of nature laws on air quality. And um, while there's some sort of conflicting evidence, you, you, you do point out that the preliminary evidence uh, points in the direction that there actually is an effective uh, and uh, a significant effect. And so I think that your paper is really unique. Uh, I mean, 
uh, as you said, there has not been much literature uh, at all, especially in the field of economics. And I think that uh, this research topic is extremely important because um, as you highlighted in, in your paper, a lot of people die every year because of bad air quality. So that's definitely uh, something that we, we as a society have to fix in the future. And so um, maybe these rights of, air, uh, rights of nature could be uh, one way in which uh, we could, we could um, increase air quality. And um, I think that you, you have some good theoretical background also in the paper. You highlighted that um, these, uh, that externalities could be at play here. Um, but I think that you could uh, have some more discussion on, on the theoretical considerations. And what comes to mind to me first is uh, that this might be comparable to a sort of Pigouvian tax, these rights of nature laws. Um, but I think that in general, uh, you should really continue uh, in, with, this, with this research topic. And uh, you really notice that you're really passionate about about this uh, topic. So um, that's great. And I think those are all of my comments. I tried to keep it short. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Floor is open for Q&As. Yes. So in, <clears throat> when you began, I thought you were going to discuss utility functions for trees, mm -hmm. something about what trees want. And all I heard is what humans want. Mm -hmm. you, you probably don't know this, but I am a tree. I want more greenhouse gases. CO2 is a great fertilizer for me. You're going to give it to me? That is a really great question. So what, that is one of the, the main debates in the sort of legal literature is like yeah. well how can how can people speak on behalf of the trees like how can people speak on behalf of the environment and i think that what it what it comes down to is it's it's less about like a specific um, animal within the ecosystem and more about the ecosystem as a whole and the functioning of the system as a whole and so a lot of times what this looks like especially in 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 indigenous areas is you might have a group of a group of people that understand the inter the complex interrelationships between the air the earth the species of the environment so if the tree as an individual tree really 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 wants more co2 like loves it just like we as people we really 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 want to keep using fossil fuels because it's so efficient so convenient for us but is that necessarily the best thing for the entire ecosystem and so it's it's about coming up it's about looking at more of the rights of these systems as opposed to individuals which is i think what characterizes rights of nature um makes it a little bit different from say like animal rights yes does that answer your question yeah, I, I understand what you do, but from a, take a point of methodological individualism, mm -hmm. I don't know, how would you ever do these trade-offs between different aspects of, na yeah. and, 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 and CO2 is, if I'm correct, a actual fertilizer. And so I, to me, it's very reasonable, not for that trade, but I, I'm confident there's a lot of forms of life that would rather have a different atmosphere than we currently have. I mean, everything you're saying is still from a, a very human, from our perspective. I, I'm just trying to figure out how do you get to nature's perspective so, without us imposing, without you imposing what you would like to see. I, yeah, yeah. So a lot of a lot of different places have taken different approaches to this. So I think a good example might be um, the Maori people in New Zealand. So they declared rights of nature for um, a historic river that is really important to uh, the indigenous people that have lived there for generations. And so in order to make sure that they are, and so they bas they basically declare the rights of this river. This river is now a person <laughs> in in New Zealand. And what they do is they have a council um, combined of both people like New Zealanders, um, like like um, people of New Zealand, like general citizens, as well as Maori people to come together to be able to evaluate cases and to evaluate what is actually in the interest of the river. Um, and so when it comes to being like, okay, there's also, yes, CO2 is one measure of one thing that trees also like, but there's many, many, many other measures in the environment of things that can change over time that might make things favor favorable or unfavorable. So as much as um, CO2 is great, oh, yes, 
breath of, breath of fresh air, producing lots of oxygen. Um, at the same time, you're going to have rising temperatures, which is going to mean that diseases are going to be more widespread, which means that well, more, more trees, more plants, more animals are going to get diseases, more people are going to get diseases, which ultimately will not benefit them. So I think definitely more work needs to be done in order to understand these competing effects. And I think that a definitely collaboration with ecologists who are much more um, like deeply, deeply rooted in, in, the, in the understanding of these interrelationships is necessary in order to understand, well, what does nature want and how could we ac accurately represent this in court by sort of a proxy, similar to how children can be represented in court by, like, the, by the parents, something like, something like that. Yeah, are there any more questions? Any more questions? Uh, hey, Sedona. Yeah, um, are we out of time? Oh, we're out of time. Are we out of time? No. Oh, wait, someone's asking me a question. Yes, over here. Oh, Sorry. oh yes. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm a RA here at the bank. Um, I wanted to ask you a question a little bit about the idea of the, the causal mechanism yeah. um, of these laws of nature, like opposed to some sort of law that sets a limit on pollution or a tax on pollution, et cetera. Um, essentially, like, do you have a sense of how binding these laws actually are? Um, I'm assuming, mm. I guess asking rather, um, in what cases would you actually see that causal mechanism mediated? Like, does there need to be some sort of court case of some sort of development that's blocked or plan to expand a business or build a plant, et cetera, that's blocked because of the law? Um, if so, do you have that, that data available? Is that something you've thought about implementing? Yes, yeah, so there's, um, actually I just found one yesterday. So for Tam Tamaqua Borough, one of the things that they were looking at was fly ash that was being dumped, which gets into the air, gets into your lungs, it's pretty bad. And so they were able to um, sue companies and find them. In other places like the Ojibwe, Ojibwe um, uh, the White Earth Clan of the Ojibwe Nation in Wisconsin, they are actually in an active legal battle since they declared rights of nature for um, wild rice with a company that wants to build a pipeline through the reservation. So it doesn't, I don't, I'm not gonna say it necessarily is stopping it, but it's definitely making it a little bit harder to, 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 to go through. So those are, some, those are some examples, and there are other examples um, mostly at the national level in terms of inter big, big companies, so, but that is, that is a really important question, which is, okay, does this work at the local level? Are people actually going to be able to enforce this and are people enforcing this? And so that's one of the things that I definitely would want to see in the future is a better understanding of, okay, these laws might work, but do they work in what circumstances? Does it only work if you have like a, if it's like the, the constitution says it or does, it, does there need to be more done there? But yeah, that's a really, really, really great question. Hi. Um, my question was, how do you plan on, in the future even, kind of getting this confounding variable between just regulations from the EPA in general on what corporations can and can't do to the environment versus these rights of natures? Like, do you think that the rights of natures are actually having this impact or if it's just increased regulations? So that is a really good question. And I think that more robust um, econometric methods will be able to answer that question. So right now, some ideas that I have would be to, first of all, only compare within states. So if different states are enacting different policies, that might make things different. So if you have a lot of rights of nature bills that are passed in Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania also at the same time is passing more strict regulations on air quality, that is something that we would have to account for. And we, pro we could account for by doing perhaps like, instead of, instead of saying, oh, we're gonna do all, the average of all of these states, we could do, we could impose um, state fixed effects or we could exclusively do, where we could use um, matching, like um, like a propensity score matching to see, okay, well let's match this um, county with another county that is similar to it and a bunch of other measures that would suggest that this one would also pass the bill eventually, so then we could do that one-to-one -one matching to see if maybe it is the bill. Um, in terms of national, national laws, I think that gets a little bit more tricky, where you have, if the EPA is, enacting a lot of laws that are going to try to improve air quality standards overall, it is likely that those might impact um, certain places like the ones with lower air quality already more than places that have higher air quality. So what I would do for that is I would say using different measures of, of the environment, um, environmental health, as well as looking at particular particles in the air as opposed to the general air quality index. Because then you can see like, oh, if it's targeting this particle, maybe a different one. Yes, and I am out of time. But thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you all so much for your feedback. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Sedona. Uh, now moving forward with our next discussant, 
for session one, speaker, sorry, session one, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Rilich, a junior at a University of Kentucky presenting horses or housing, estimating the impact of the purchase of development rights program. Nicholas, it's all you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Nicholas, um, and I'm from the University of Kentucky, and I'm here to present my paper, uh, Horses or Housing. Um, and so, uh, first, special th shout out to the Shelgren Center, who helped sponsor my travel over to this conference. Um, so, localities, uh, every city has something unique about it. Um, and with Lexington, uh, we have a booming equine industry. Uh, and so, this is important both economically and culturally. Um, it's known by many as the horse capital of the world. Um, and just driving around Lexington, uh, you can see just how much of the land is used for, uh, for farming and these kind of purposes. Um, but there's also um, the population of Lexington has been growing. Um, steadily, 9% since 2010. Um, and so local governments face this trade-off that they have to uh, work around between uh, preserving this culturally important industry and farms, uh, but also uh, growing and, uh, enough to be able to support um, the growth of the economy and uh, the population of Lexington. Um, and so this paper really aims to try to evaluate the benefits of two programs that restrict development in Lexington um, to try to better um, better uh, gauge some of these benefits uh, to better support these trade-off decisions. Uh, so the first uh, policy is the urban service boundary, just real quick. So uh, this was the first of its kind um, in the nation, and it began in 1958. And basically what it does is everything within this boundary that you see um, is uh, any residential development that is inside there, uh, any residents inside there have increased access to city services. Uh, so the goal is to incentivize centralization uh, within the county uh, to preserve these lands outside of the urban service boundary for, um, for farming and those kind of purposes. Um, and the second half of my paper uh, does a difference and difference model that's really cool. Uh, but for today, I'm just going to focus on the second program that this paper looks at, which is the Purchase of Development Rights Program. Um, and this program is more recent, began in 2001. Uh, and basically what this program does is the city will go to uh, these different horse farm uh, property owners um, and they'll say, we will purchase the development rights of your farm, as the name implies, and it contractually guarantees that this farm can only be used uh, for farming purposes in the future. It can't be sold for any kind of residential development. So it further constricts um, the land use um, of, these, of these properties. Um, and so this could have benefits in two ways. Um, one, just by the farms themselves. Being, if you're located next to one of these farms, it's obviously very scenic, very beautiful. Um, you get some positive externality as a homeowner from being uh, near these farms. Uh, but also the other part of this that I hope to estimate was um, if this PR program in and of itself, when it, when it starts and it actually um, guarantees basically, like if you're one of these neighbors of these farms, that you would have a guaranteed scenic backyard um, for perpetuity, because it's not going to go away. You don't have any risk of it being developed for housing or anything like that. Um, and so, uh, and just to give a perspective on um, how much uh, land these farms take up, uh, you can see, so every, everything in green is one of these PDR farms that's been preserved. Um, and so it's quite a, significant, um, quite a significant amount of land. And especially as Lexington has continued to grow, uh, they're definitely having to face these trade-off concerns. Um, and so uh, to address uh, this research question, um, I really wanted to look at those two potential impacts. Uh, one, um, does being within a half mile of just one of these farms, whether uh, just being within a half mile of one of these farms, does that have some benefit in and of itself? But also, um, does uh, being within a half mile of a farm that's already an operational PDR, that is never going to be sold uh, for any kind of other development purposes, there's not gonna be a gas station built behind your house ever, does that also have an impact? And so I hypothesize that both of these have a positive impact on the price, of the sale price of a house. Um, and the null hypothesis would be that they're equal to zero or less than zero. Um, and so just as a theoretical model, so uh, a lot of the literature um, that works around uh, housing policy um, uses what's uh, called a hedonic pricing model. And so basically the idea behind these is that you have, uh, you can set the property value of a home um, as a function of many different characteristics, a basket of characteristics that um, 
home buyers look for. Um, so that's physical characteristics like age or size of the house, um, but also geographical characteristics. So the school district that you're in would have an impact on the price of your house. Um, and then some other factors that might be uh, coming into play depending on the region. And so um, in this study, um, I measured property value as sale price in real dollars. Um, and these are just a uh, list of the variables I included in this model. Uh, and so the top two are the treatment variables. Uh, and they're both dummy variables. So one is just, are you in a half mile of one of these farms? Um, but also, um, are you sold, is the house sold um, within the same distance of an operational PDR, where it's guaranteed never to be sold again uh, for, any, for any other purposes? And so included uh, a couple of physical characteristics, as well as school district and census tract to kind of narrow down uh, some of these locational uh, variables. And the data came from the property valuation minister of Lexington, as well as Lexington publicly available data, um, and um, Fred I used to control for um, inflation. So the model itself, uh, so kind of already has been uh, described here. So we have the logarithm of real price, and that's to get these coefficients as um, percentage, um, in terms of percentage change of the real price. Um, and we have our uh, control variables as well as our treatment variables in red. Um, and as well, we, I ran a Birch Pagan test to make sure uh, we didn't have uh, heteroscedasticity, and we uh, rejected the null, and we found there was heteroscedasticity. So, in order to control for that uh, non constant variance, uh, we use robust standard errors in our model. That's just to show um, some of this not quite so constant variance. Um, and so, what I found was kind of interesting. So the uh, variable for if you uh, were sold within a half mile of an operational PDR, so this, this property that's never going to be sold again, um, that variable was not statistically significant. Um, but the variable for if you're just sold within a half mile of this farm in general, uh, that was significant and with an estimated coefficient of um, 0.226. And so just to show some of the regression here, um, so again, we see the first uh, model that we ran, uh, that I ran here, um, this, this effect of um, making sure that this PDR property is never going to be sold for anything, that doesn't appear to be statistically significant when we control for other variables. Um, but uh, just being within a half mile of this property does have some impact. And it's also similar to um, what previous research and literature has estimated, so um, other uh, other researchers at UK um, put out this report an uh, analyzing the urban service boundary, and then so they found that if you're right on the border of that urban service boundary and you're close to these rural lands, uh, your home has a premium of 1.8% uh, compared to compared to other homes. Um, and so this is this estimate would be kind of similar to that of uh, this model showing a 2.2% uh, premium for just being with one of these within one of these farms. So that's more consistent with the with the literature. So. Uh, in conclusion, um, it appears that PDR, the program itself, doesn't inherently create value, which is if, if that variable, if the near PDR variable where um, the, the PDR property is operational and it's being sold at the same time, so there's never going to be, that, that PDR farm is never going to be developed for anything, that, that in inherently doesn't create value. Um, but it appears that it does preserve some of these values. So if, if these farm lands in and of themselves um, have this positive externality, have this uh, positive benefit for homeowners to be able to see and look out and enjoy the scenic beauty of uh, the Kentucky bluegrass and uh, these horse farms, then uh, it appears from this, uh, from these results that that does have some, some benefit. So uh, with this robust standard error model, uh, we fail to reject the, the null of the near PDR variable, um, but we do reject um, the null of this, uh, just being within a half mile of these PDR um, properties. And so, as far as future research, um, so the, this is only looking at the benefits of these programs, and obviously as policymakers, um, they would need to look at both the cost and the benefits of these programs, and considering these supply issues, because when you're um, constraining the available land, um, the land available for potential residential developments, you're inherently restricting supply and restricting these growth 
And so uh, really getting an idea of what the cost is of these programs uh, is essential in order to kind of weigh these uh, potential benefits um, of these programs. So, um, so yeah, thank you all for, um, for being here today. Thank you, Nicholas. I open the floor for our discussion. Leonard. Yeah, uh, hi, Nicholas. Thanks for presenting your uh, really interesting paper. Um, so your paper covered uh, a, a niche in, in urban economics and asked whether there is a, a positive effect of being uh, located near farmland that will be always preserved as farmland in uh, the Kentucky County of uh, Lexington. And um, so the, the farmland uh, that will always be preserved as farmland uh, that you looked at is part of the PDR program, um, the Purchase of Development Rights program, which uh, uh, which includes a, a sale of the land to the county and uh, the county then ensures that farmland will always uh, be, be kept farmland and not be, uh, will not be made into residential development land. And in your literature review in the paper, you, you show that Kentuckians uh, seem to have an interest or seem to have not only public interests in preserving farmland, but also private interests in, in preserving farmland as other papers um, have shown. And so, you know, you're really motivated well that there is the possibility that being located near farmland protected by the PDR could have an impact on the value of residential property. And um, so to do that, to, to estimate this impact, you use a, uh, your, the hedonic model, which is a, a model uh, that's typical in, in uh, real estate research. And uh, as you showed very nicely, uh, the model estimates uh, a linear relationship to the log of the dependent model, which is in this case, uh, the sale price. And um, what I want to mention is that this, this model has the advantage of allowing for a variation in the dollar value of a particular characteristic. So for an example, in just a linear uh, OLS model, you, Every room, for example, that is added to a house would have the same dollar impact on uh, the, the sale price or, or the predicted sale price. But in the semi-log model, uh, this is not the case. And so you'd use that to test whether being within a uh, half mile radius of the PDR of PDR protected farmland uh, increases or, or has an effect on property values. And you show that um, that actually being in this half mile radius uh, does have a, a small uh, positive impact on small, but a significant uh, positive impact on, on uh, residential property values. And I think that this research is really important because you, it really shows that, um, that it's also important to, to look at uh, policies on not just on a federal level, uh, but also on a county level to, to see whether they actually are uh, whether they, they have the effects that, that were intended to, uh, by, by the policymakers. And um, so this research could be really valuable to, to the county itself. And I think that your structure is really great. Um, you really uh, give a good introduction um, because, I mean, not many people will, will know what the topic is exactly about. It's not too short, that it's confusing, it's not too long, that it's hard to read or hard to, to follow in the presentation. Um, but when thinking about the uh, your model, I would maybe decrease the radius to the farmland um, that could be that that uh, to something lower than half a mile, because I mean, if you look at it from an, on a map, half a mile doesn't seem too big. But uh, when you look at it sort of practically in reality, half a mile is actually quite far from farmland. So I mean, you'd, you'd have to walk quite a bit just to get to the farmland and you probably wouldn't be able to see it just looking out of your window. And I mean, maybe the data set would be smaller, but I think that that's worth looking into if there uh, might be also a uh, significant effect at sort of a quarter mile radius or even less than that. And maybe that uh, this effect could be larger, who knows. But I think that um, this, this research is really valuable and that you should continue to, to look into this. And as I said, it could really uh, provide some great value for, for uh, Lexington County. Thank you, Leonard. Um, I open the floor to the Q&A portion. Very interesting paper. Uh, regarding your discussant's comment about the radius, 
You may look at some of the new literature on the effect of repossessions and foreclosures and what evidence they find there about how far away these foreclosures have an effect on house prices. So it's not just, may not just be an, an issue of the view that one may have, but also uh, people have a demand for, to live in an area and how much land is available for building. So there might be some guidance from that literature that might be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I'll have to look into that for sure. And as far as the, the radius uh, question is concerned, that is a very good, uh, very good point. And so actually, uh, in, a, in the course of this research, I did kind of a different sensitivity, sensitivity analysis to see uh, estimating with these different radius sizes. Um, and sample size was definitely a huge challenge, because definitely once you get to these closer radiuses, which I would have wanted to, um, it's you get really, really small numbers, and so it's kind of hard to hard to make good conclusions about that. But I'll definitely I'll have to look into that for for future research. Uh, hey, Nicholas, question. Um, I wanted to ask. So, with um, the more properties decide to um, accept like this PDR offer to not have the land developed, uh, theoretically, like you mentioned at the beginning, it would be like slowing development in some ways. Um, and if you have lower housing supply, you would expect house prices to increase. Do you have a sense of how much is kind of this amenity view that preserving the land and having this good view is what's driving the increase in prices or whether it could just be a reduction in supply? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so definitely for future research, you know, incorporating that supply component would be definitely crucial to kind of uh, really narrowing down this benefit. Um, I focus mainly on the, just the amenity, amenity benefit piece with this paper, um, and the other part that was kind of, um, I guess, reassuring in, in some ways um, with that result was that it, since it was comparable to what other researchers had found as far as like how, what the premium was for just that amenity benefit, um, it, would, it would make sense that it would be kind of, kind of similar. But definitely, you know, going into those supply concerns is it would be the, next, the most straightforward next step with this. Oh, kind of going off of that, do you know have any idea, it's okay, like how much, like what percentage of total land in Kentucky is designated to be farm only? Um, I don't have an exact number off the top of my head, but I mean, just looking off the map as, which was kind of an interesting visual, I mean, it's definitely a significant amount of that um, land that's outside of this urban service boundary. Um, so any potential expansion of that urban service boundary, any pot potential um, growth of the city, uh, it would be kind of hard if, you know, if all of that is just completely preserved in, for rural land. Um, but it's, it's definitely um, a significant amount because it's obviously, you know, historically and culturally, it's, uh, the horse industry has been super important for uh, Lexington. And so um, it's definitely a significant, a significant percentage. We have one question from Zoom on Zoom. Um, nice paper and presentation. Are there any timing predictability impacts that could matter for estimates? There is probably a lot a lag from the time the city may first consider a property for the program. Price impacts may register at the outset of the process. With less impact on the price once the property is actually in the program, will the estimates be able to pick up the price impacts that occur early rather than once the property is officially in the program? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great, great question. So the way that um, the methodology that I approach uh, this paper and with this data set, um, I, it was more of just, so basically it was kind of like an interaction variable of, you know, if, is this um, house sold next to this PDR property? And is that PDR property operational in the same year that it's sold? Um, and so I didn't really take into account the um, like the lag impact, that's definitely would be a relevant thing to look at. Um, but I, I think that the, 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 I want the more simplistic route with this model, um, largely because, you know, it's only been around for 20 something years, this program. Um, and so, uh, but definitely for future, future research, that would be important to consider. Thank you, Nicholas. Now for our next presenter, David Stoneman, a senior Oberlin College presenting applications of deep learning in forecasting inflation in the pandemic economy. David, are you? Thank you. 
Hi, so my name is David, uh, currently a senior at Oberlin College, double majoring in philosophy and economics. And today I'm going to be talking about two things that are very in vogue lately, uh, deep learning and inflation. Um, specifically using inflation to try and forecast um, inflation following the COVID pandemic, see if we can't, or see if we can't uh, glean some insight from doing so. So uh, just giving some background uh, on the problem. So in 2022, Core PCE inflation reached its highest level in decades, peaking at 6% in Q2. And uh, FOMC and SPF long-term forecasts and just general stimulatory monetary policy uh, in 2020 and 2021 evidence, or we can take it as evidence, that the general expectation for future inflation was that it would just maintain its uh, decade-long trend, um, just generally being very low. Um, and you know, given the unprecedented economic circumstances of the pandemic, um, this begs the question, was there a potential way to forecast this better, anticipate this better, and um, maybe take some proactive measures? So this is just a graph uh, comparing the SPF one year predicted versus actual inflation between 2009 and 2022. Uh, and so you can see following the Great Recession, inflation remains fairly low and steady. and SPF forecasts are generally fairly accurate, but once there's a, a regime shift um, in 2020 and 2021 specifically, um, the error just goes up exponentially uh, by an order of magnitude, actually. Um, and so my hypothesis that I wanted to test in doing this work is uh, that deep learning time series forecasting methods could have made a better one-year inflation forecast for 2022 than the SPF. Um, so first, talk about make, or what the case is for deep learning models in the first place, because they're not something typically used in the field of econometrics. Um, so a couple advantages. They are much more flexible with handling seasonality um, or regime shifts, um, and just generally better at handling volatility. Uh, they're not quite as stylized as um, some of the regressive models uh, I've encountered, DSGE and things like that. Um, and they're nonlinear uh, and just inherently function differently than regression um, models and don't have the same problems of collinearity, which means that they can use as many, at least at a theoretical level, as many um, collinear variables uh, as one would ever want to. So it, does, it, it makes it easier to find um, data to work with. Um, and just a quick note on the current state of deep learning and economics. Uh, there's a growing but still relatively small amount of research being done as the field of data science kind of develops and comes to its own right. Um, <clears throat> and the black box problem is still uh, a fairly significant barrier to wider adoption, um, which black box problem refers to uh, the difficulty looking at what variables or how the model might be making decisions, um, <clears throat> especially in a policy context, you know, where you need to explain why you made a decision. Uh, that's not an arbitrary problem at all. That's so something to bear in mind. But let's move on to the model that I decided to put together for this project. So um, LSTM, or long short-term memory, uh, was actually conceptualized in the 90s, but um, really took off as a recurrent neural network um, time series uh, framework in the last five years or so. Um, so generally speaking, recurrent neural networks are uh, able to map long-term dependencies and data um, through a process called backpropagation, um, <clears throat> but have a, a few uh, notorious issues, um, at least with typical vanilla recurrent neural networks, um, where yeah, I won't get into the nuts and bolts of that, but LSTM solves that problem by uh, mapping out and adjudicating different weights to long and short-term dependencies um, at different points in the data and adjusting uh, as necessary. So uh, the data that I, or, yeah, the data that I chose to analyze started out with uh, around 1,000 quarterly time series from Fred uh, going back to 1960, and then used uh, basically a decision tree to regress those uh, time series um, and pick the top 251s that were most correlated with or had the, yeah, they were most predictive of uh, core PCE. <clears throat> and then after that, normalize the data by rescaling all the values such that they fit between 
negative one and one, and that's more of a convention in um, data science where uh, it actually improves performance quite quite significantly. Um, <clears throat> and so, after that uh, comes the question of, you know, I guess dividing the data set up into training, validation, and test sets. Um, and so, the training period in question was 1960 to uh, 2021 Q2. Um, and the reason for that, as opposed to, I guess, uh, a more recent um, sample period with a wider breadth of variables to train on, is that there are a couple periods um, of really high inflation that the model can learn from, um, specifically the energy crisis in the 70s, also uh, some inflation spikes throughout the 80s. Um, <clears throat> next, I uh, used a window generator to create just random batches of samples uh, that had a back cast of X values and were trained to um, improve projections at T plus four periods. And so now onto the results. So yeah, this is a graph of um, LSTM predicted versus actual inflation for 2022. <clears throat> so it does a, a fairly good job of capturing the magnitude of the spike and just the general directionality of uh, the peak that we all um, ha or experienced last year. But what's crazy is putting that next to the SPF, <coughs> excuse me, is plotting that next to the SPF one year predictions for that same period. Um, uh, yeah, not a whole lot to say here. Uh, and then that begs the question if, you know, maybe there's not some way to get even more accurate results if we were to incorporate COVID-specific data because we are um, using a data set going back to 1960. Uh, and so this uh, was a graph of um, a couple of trial runs with and without COVID-19-specific data just for the period um, where that data was available. And so as you can see, there's a lot more lag um, and it just does not perform nearly as well as before. Um, so that there are a couple ways to potentially think about that. One is that um, maybe COVID wasn't all that um, different than, or the fundamental relationship between the underlying forces at play did not fundamentally change so much as to throw off a model or to prevent um, us from learning and, and forecasting it. Um, and yeah, so if, drawing some conclusions from these results, uh, deep learning, I think poses a potential solution for uh, pro proactively dealing with future global crises, especially as they come up with like, climate change. Um, and it shows that it is applicable in some capacity. It's not the be all end all replacement for all our typical um, econometric methods, but it is a good tool to add to our toolkit. Um, and there is progress actively being made on solving the black box problem. Um, so that we can actually look back and see how the model is making its decisions. Um, yeah, and you know, we can, if, if funding were allocated specifically to develop frameworks for economic applications, I mean, the, the sky's the limit. Um, and we can still learn about the macro economy from these models, even if uh, we can't see how it's um, weighing the importance of different variables. Uh, specifically by you know, the fact that it's able to forecast something like this um, implies that there was something that I learned in the past to um, look at in the future. So I guess now's a good time to take questions. Thank you, David. Um, the floor is uh, Leonard. Uh, yeah, thanks, David, for, for um, your presentation of this amazing paper. Um, I want to keep it short because I see that we're nearly out of time already and so maybe we can have uh, a bit of time for questions. Um, so basically your paper was about uh, about trying to apply neural networks, uh, LSCM, long short-term short memory neural networks to uh, forecasting inflation. And you showed that um, in fact these, uh, a neural network that you created uh, outperformed um, the forecasts of uh, of the survey of professional forecasters by uh, quite a quite a margin, 
and um, that even when there are sudden regime changes, such as the COVID pandemic, that uh, the neural network can de deal with these changes and um, is still applicable and still gives a reasonable forecast of inflation. And I think that um, this research is very important because it shows that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are, are things that economists should actually consider uh, when predicting uh, when predicting different macroeconomic variables, um, even if there are some considerations or some reservations uh, regarding the economic theory behind them. Um, yeah, but uh, I think that you motivate your, your research very well. It's uh, Everything was very nicely structured, even though the topic is uh, quite complex in its nature. And I think that your findings are very uh, clearly presented. Um, and I think that uh, just just as a um, as an anecdote, maybe uh, that some some future research could be could be uh, could be possible here. Uh, first of all, I think that maybe you could uh, include some sort of cross validation to see if uh, if your model is suffering maybe from overfitting. Um, so that's that's one point that I would make uh, to improve the, the research uh, of yours. And um, one other thing that I uh, was thinking about is that um, in the field of inflation forecasting, what is often done is to, uh, to forecast every single, um, every single bucket of goods uh, in the, um, in the basket of goods that that is uh, that makes up a given uh, inflation time series to forecast those individually and then combine that in some sort of ensemble model into a general forecast and so that's maybe also something that you could look into uh, in the future but I think that in general um, this research is re really promising and shows that um, other types of, of models could be used uh, to forecast inflation and that these models tend to be, or, or could even be better than um, what economists have typically uh, produced as forecasts on their own. No, absolutely. Um, I hadn't even thought about the last technique or met, you know, potential uh, method you just brought up, that, but that's definitely something I'll check out now. <laughs> Thank you, Leonard. The floor is open to the Q&A portion. You mentioned that the sort of black box problem is being worked on. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so. I mean, what, what, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. There's, I mean, this is a paper that I <clears throat> stumbled across uh, sort of been a couple months ago. It's kind of an obscure um, startup uh, called Nixtla. It's a very hard, way, or very hard word to pronounce, but they published a paper uh, early last year um, talking about their sort of new approach to using neural networks to forecast time series specific, it's very time series specific. LSTM can be used for uh, natural language processing or anything that has, you know, deals with sequential data like that. Um, here it tries to reconstruct Fourier series that go into uh, whatever trend you're trying to predict and map. And so as a, as a result of that, you can kind of break down, um, or it, I mean, it can show you the constituent Fourier series that go into something. That's one that I've heard of, I've just generally heard of other um, work being done in that area. Hi, David. Great presentation. Um, I had a kind of a question. Have you considered looking at a different evaluation window or perhaps looking like a, like a broader evaluation window? Because from what it looked like, you were only looking at four periods of 2022. But you know, what if we looked at, for example, post-2008 great financial crisis and just go everything from 2008 onwards to COVID? And do you know like out of sample forecasts for that? Do your results still um, outperform the SPF, or is, it, is that something you've considered looking at yet? I haven't looked further back than 2020. Okay, um, it's something that is probably worth investigating. Um, I'd imagine it'd probably be on par with SPF, just because. Um, yeah, the, I mean, there was, uh, as I was saying, the graph. Um, it they were pretty accurate when times were good, and then. You know, when things change up all of a sudden, it, maybe not so much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, please join me in thanking our presenters and discussants for a very interesting and informative session.